But for those of you who have been in the country, you might know there's some things that with American sensibilities you never quite get used to. Riding in the Tokyo subway comes to mind. My very first exposure to the country brought me right through downtown Tokyo so I could then catch the railway to points north, and the flight happened to arrive such that I was going through there in the evening rush hour. Now, riding the Tokyo subway during the evening rush hour basically entails not even elbowing, because you don't have enough room to expand your elbows, but more like shouldering your way in between people, and these immaculately dressed, incredibly polite, uniform attendants with white gloves have the job of gently but firmly shoving people onto the trains so that you're packed even more like sardines, and the doors can close before the next train loads, usually about 90 seconds later. It's a mob scene, to put it lightly. And the American idea of personal space is nowhere to be found in this scene. And then once I got to the lab and began my internship, I quickly learned that if I had to use the men's room in our particular part of the lab around maybe 4, 4.30 in the afternoon on a weekday, that the attendant of the opposite gender, who would clean the restroom at that time every day, would happily saunter on in without knocking, and if I happened to be there, even give me maybe a polite slap on the butt as a greeting and a friendly <laughs> smile. This took some getting used to. <laughs> and as much as in my conscious mind I could continue to rehearse the refrain of, it's a different culture, things are different here, just go with it, there was a part of me at a more visceral level that could never quite find a comfort zone with this. Those of you who have been to a culture that is quite different from the one we're used to here, or perhaps born into a culture quite different from the one we're used to here, may be familiar with this idea. It's cultural dissonance, cultural clash. There's, there's some things about just the unspoken understandings and the rhythms of life that never quite sit right if they don't match what you were born with and what you were raised with in your early years. Well, Christmas is the ultimate culture clash. In Christmas, we have the culture of the heavenly places, the culture of the kingdom of God breaking its way into our own earthly realm. We hear it spoken probably most profoundly in the gospel that we always get for this Sunday, the one you just heard, the first 18 verses, the prologue of the gospel of John. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. But we cannot ignore the fact stated more than once in this prologue that as heaven's word, the wisdom by which all things were created, became flesh, became a living human being, and dwelt among us, things didn't go quite so well. He came to what was his own, but his own did not receive him. Now it's always struck me a little bit that if you pay really close attention to the church calendar, the three days that just passed leading up to this Sunday, two of those three days, all of which are high feast days, are ones that are actually quite dark. The 26th of December is St. Stephen's Day. St. Stephen is known as the first deacon of the church. His story is recorded in chapters 6, 7, and 8 of the Book of Acts. Now, St. Stephen is also one of the church's earliest martyrs. When he's brought before the council in Jerusalem, he testifies to them, and in response, they drag him out and stone him. This is not exactly happy, joyful, merry Christmas type of stuff. And then we have the Feast of St. John on the 27th, John the Evangelist. Well, that makes sense for Christmas season. And then on the 28th, we have the observance of the Holy Innocents. These are all the children to and under that King Herod ordered to be slaughtered in his rage when he had heard that the Messiah had been born in Bethlehem and 
then the wise men tricked him so that he couldn't actually find Jesus. Again, not very merry stuff. But when I think about what Christmas really is, this isn't a surprise. Christmas is the head-on collision that happens when heaven shows up on earth. And while the ultimate result of that is something beautiful beyond all compare, the pathway that gets us there might not look so pretty. Let's think about just what a big clash this is. We only have little hints of what the culture and economy of the kingdom of heaven look like, but they're strong hints. Here on earth, the logic is all about competition, and it's all about finitude, finiteness. Everything we say, think, and do is informed by the understanding that time and resources are finite. There's only so much we can get done in a day, in an hour, in a lifetime. There's only so much stuff to go around and to sustain us and the rest of the creatures of this planet. And ultimately, that makes it competitive. For every winner, for every gainer, there must be a loser. But heaven's economy looks nothing like that. It stretches our imaginations to the breaking point. In heaven's economy, there is existence outside of time. There's no such thing as running out of time for accomplishing what one desires to accomplish. There's no such thing as running out of resources. There's no such thing as one creature needing to kill, conquer, destroy, consume another for its own sustenance and joy. It is a commonwealth in the truest sense of that word. We see it in the accounts in the book of Acts of how the early church lived together. It's a little chilling to those who who think that communism, the real meaning of that word, is an evil thing because it actually shows up in the Bible, folks. They share all things in common. But this was a voluntary communism. This was a wholehearted, every person bought in with their full selves, their full wills, their full dignities. And even that was only a foreshadowing of the commonwealth to come. So, when heaven's man shows up on earth, it's not surprising that an earth that is so immersed, so stuck in the ideology of competition and affinitude is not going to receive him very well. And it creates the story that we know so well. But even, even at the point that it converges like a vortex, the cross on Calvary's hill, we still see the beauty shining through. Where earth brings its ultimate instrument of competition and of cruelty and of shame to play, Jesus reigns from it like it's his throne and like he is the king that he truly is. So what does this all mean for us? I think it means that the nostalgia and the regret that we often feel when we see what church has become in the last half century or so is perhaps a little misplaced. There's a sense of, gosh, I just wish it were like the good old days, when so many more people came to church, when the culture seemed so much more Christian. Well, my friends, I'm going to say there's never been such a thing as a Christian culture. Perhaps the churches were indeed larger, but those really weren't the good old days. The good old days actually don't exist. Because if the church is really acting as a reflection of the heavenly culture and the heavenly economy, by its very nature, it's going to run at loggerheads with the culture around it. So the fact that we're a little bit smaller, that we feel a little bit more marginalized, this may not necessarily be a bad thing. This may actually be an indication that ultimately we are moving, or at least have the opportunity to move in the right direction. Because 
friends, what we're really called to do as church is be not only witnesses, but full incarnations of that culture, that economy, of the perfect commonwealth in a world that tries to slap it down as hard as it possibly can simply because it's a culture clash. It doesn't know what to do with that. It didn't know what to do with Jesus, and it continues not to know what to do with us when we live into heaven's economy and culture. So friends, that's the job we have to do. We don't need to worry about how big or how small we are. We definitely don't need to worry if we're countercultural and if the culture around us looks upon us with opposition or even disdain. That might actually be kind of a good sign, as strange as that might sound. What we need to do is daily, prayerfully ask ourselves, what does it look like in my own personal context, in our community's context, to live into the perfect commonwealth? It's always going to be a little stretch beyond our imaginations. It always has to be imaginative exercise. But how can we do that more and more? And just by our living in that way, we continue the good work. Jesus began until he comes again.